Hi. Okay, this video is called The Rock, The Foundation, and The Stumbling Stone. First of all, we're going to talk, take a look at the rock. The rock is a metaphor used in the Bible. It's very important for us to understand what the rock is as a metaphor. What does it represent? So we're going to start with the Old Testament and then we'll look at the New Testament. So we're going to start in Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is the song of Moses. Um, when Moses was uh, about to die after he had given Israel the law and he told them that I know you are going to rebel because you're rebellious dur during my life, you're going to be even more rebellious after I die. And so he gave them this song. And the song, uh, speak. it's like a prof prophecy about what will happen to Israel. But we're not concerned with them understanding the prophecy today, but this is these references about the rock are in the song of Moses. So, the first reference, Deuteronomy 32, verse 1 to 4. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So there is the first verse, God is the rock. Now in the same uh, chapter, We'll skip down to verse 15. Now, Jeshurun. Jeshurun is another name for Israel or Jacob. Um, and it, the, the name means upright. Uh, so, when he is upright and he gets blessed by God... And then he gets fat. And then when he's fat, then he stop, starts to forget about God and, and starts to become more self-indulged. Uh, and this is uh, typically what happens to God's people when they become unmindful of God. They, they, they are too blessed and too self-indulged. So, starting in verse 15... But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. And he forsook God which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods who they knew not, to new gods that came up newly, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat you, you are unmindful, and has forgotten God that formed you. So there, God is the rock that begat you or gave birth to you. Um, now, we'll skip down further in the Song of Moses to verse 26. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely 
and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord has not done all of this. So he's saying that God uh, wants to scatter them, the Israel, and, and, and give them up. But he, he's not going to do it because if he does that, then the enemy, the devils, would say that Israel doesn't exist because God doesn't exist. So it would reflect back badly upon God. And so he is not going to scatter them for that reason. For they are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. <clears throat> so who are they, them and us? Their rock is not our rock. Um, so this is the unbelievers and the believers within Israel. Um, the, the, there's a division now. See, he's not going to scatter Israel. He's going to divide Israel. Um, there's them and us. So their rock is against them. Our rock is on our side. So God is still the rock, but he's a different rock to them than he is to He's a different rock to the unbelievers than he is to the believers. Is this not laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongs vengeance and recompense, uh, repaying. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he sees that their power is gone, for there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted? So uh, the rock is the foundation of their beliefs. It's, it's the, the, the bedrock. The, the rock we're looking at here is the bedrock or, or a mountain made out of rock. It's the foundation of their beliefs and the foundation of their culture. So if, if God is your rock, then you will prosper and you will be safe. But if you make a different God your rock, then God, since there is no other God, God will be that different God for you, but you will not prosper. And now there's also uh, a stone. A stone is not the same as a rock. A rock is what we're thinking about the bedrock of the earth or the bedrock of the land. A stone is a rock that is separate from the bedrock. It, it's a, a movable thing. The, it can be like a giant stone for a building, or it can be a little stone for a slingshot. But it, the idea is that the rock is the massive rock of, on the land that is the foundation. It's the bedrock. A stone is a separate stone that is movable and usable. Okay, uh, let's look at some more rock verses. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. So this is, this is the song of Hannah. Hannah 
was the mother of Samuel the prophet. And Hannah was barren. And uh, the priests at the uh, tent in Shiloh were bothering her because she was barren. Uh, because they were basically saying, why are you barren? Is because something you did wrong? And so Hannah prayed to God and, and said, if you give me a man child, I will dedicate him to you forever. And so then she became pregnant and she uh, bore a man child who is the prophet Samuel. And when he was weaned and old enough, then she brought him to the tent uh, in Shiloh and she gave him to the high priest to raise him as a man of God. And uh, so once she uh, gave him away, then she sang a song to God. So this is Hannah's song, part of it. In uh, second, First Samuel chapter two, verse two, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none besides thee, neither is there any rock like our God. So there it is. Um, now, Second Samuel chapter 22. Okay, this part here, uh, I'll just read it. It's David's song. And David spoke starting in verse 1. And David spoke unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock, in him I will trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge. So David called God his rock. Uh, now we'll skip down further in, in David's song uh, to verse 32. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? So God is the only rock as far as David is concerned. And we'll skip down further to verse 47. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. So this is David saying, God is the rock. So now we'll skip to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44, verse 1 to 11. This is the the uh, the spirit. This is a prophecy about the spirit of God is going to be poured out on Israel. Starting in verse one. Yet now, hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, who I have chosen. So, what's who are Jacob and Israel? Remember, Jacob, Abraham is the father. Isaac is the son who the father was willing to sacrifice. Jacob is the man who is transformed by the Holy Spirit when he wrestled with God and he was renamed Israel. Israel is the transformed man. Jacob is the believer who is not yet transformed. Thus says the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help me. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Jeshurun, remember, means upright. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon your offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, 
as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. So what do we see when the Holy Spirit is poured upon the children of Jacob and Israel? We see different flavors of Christians or, or believers, different flavors. Some will say this, some will say this, some will say this, but they are all basically united in the Spirit and in the Lord. Okay, carrying on in verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. And who, as I, shall call and declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people, and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. So, who, uh, who appointed the ancient people? God did. Abraham is the father, Isaac is the son, Jacob is the man transformed into Israel. So, who else has declared something like this? And who else has done it? And who else declared it since ancient times? There is nobody. There is no other God. I don't know of any God out there in the world that has done anything like this. So that's what he's saying. This is proof. I am God. There is no other. Starting in verse 8. Fear you not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and declared it? You are even my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. So now this is a mistranslation in the King James. It should say, Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no rock. I know not any. So the King James is a great uh, translation. And it's not perfect, but it's the best one in my opinion. Because it's translated from the best manuscripts. Um, now, back in the time of the King James Bible translation, they didn't know anywhere near as much about the scriptures as we do. It was new to them. It was untranslated yet. There were only a few people who could actually read it. And it was a second language to them. They had, when the King James Bible was made, they had teams of scholars and they gave each team a piece of the Bible to translate. And that's why you'll see uh, a name is spelled differently in different parts of the Bible, the same name, because it was different teams. And, uh, you know, they, they had some translation errors. They didn't know. God, I am a rock. They thought, it can't be right. They, so they said, I am God, there is no other God. Because they didn't understand the metaphor of the rock. So that's why that is a mistranslation. But I, I checked the Hebrew, and uh, it is rock. And other Bibles are translated rock. You are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? Yea, there is no rock. I know not any. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity, and their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses. They see not nor know that they may be ashamed. Who has formed a God or molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen 
they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. So, the uh, people of God shall not fear and not be afraid, but uh, the people who worship graven images, they shall be in fear. And they shall be ashamed or embarrassed, and they shall run and hide. So remember that. That will become important later on in our studies. That there's these, Israel is divided. Those who believe in God and who truly worship God, and those parts of Israel that worship other gods and graven images. So... Uh, the, the people of God shall not fear and shall not be ashamed and their hope God is their hope they will they will be rejoice when they see God the people who worship graven images they will not rejoice they will be ashamed and in fear so now we're going to take a look at three specific verses in the Hebrew scriptures pertaining to the stumbling stone and the foundation stone. So if we look at Isaiah chapter 8 verse 13, uh, this is about um, God's salvation is coming. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Uh, a jinn is the same as a snare, but it's for catching birds. Um, a snare is for catching small animals. So this, this um, he, God, shall be a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling. So he's a sanctuary to the believers but he's a stone of stumbling to the unbelievers. And he's a jinn and a snare. He's a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He's going to snare them all in a net. Isaiah chapter 28, verse 14 to 19. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because you have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. And when the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. Therefore thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. Or make haste is to panic. He that believes shall not panic and run and hide and be ashamed. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. So the line and the plummet. Uh, we talked about this before. The plummet is a string that you hold uh, with a weight on it. And it uh, is the way in ancient times they would use to make a wall level straight up and down by, by hanging a plummet on a string. And the line is when they would stretch out the string along the wall. That's the line 
that they would follow to make the wall straight. So, um, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be tra trodden down by it. So God is going to lay a foundation stone in Zion, in Jerusalem. And the plummet and the line are going to build God's temple. Now this was Isaiah before the second temple was built. So there are, that's the end times. The end times, when Israel was destroyed in ancient times by Babylon, that was the time of the end. And then there's a rebuilding. They rebuilt the second temple under Zerubbabel. Well, we spoke about the prophet Zechariah and, and the plumb line and the, the, the line and the plummet in that too. And then there's a, the, another destruction of Jerusalem after Jesus was uh, uh, crucified and resurrected. Then Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. That was another end times. And now there's coming a third end times, and that's the second coming of Christ. All right. Now, we've looked at those two verses in Isaiah, chapter 8 and chapter 28. And there is another verse in Psalm 118 about the stone the builders rejected. Let's take a look at it. This is, um, actually, we're going to look at another one first. We're going to take a look at, uh, we're going to let Jesus introduce Psalm 118 for us. We'll take a look at Matthew chapter 21. The, everything has to be in context. Remember, don't take any verse and not look at what the context is and what is it actually talking about. Um, people who teach the Bible, I'm seeing it more and more all the time and where they will throw out these Bible verses and to justify what they're teaching and when you really go look at the verse, it's not talking about anything like what they're trying to justify. It, it doesn't fit in with what they're teaching. You have to look at when the verse was said, what was happening at the time when that verse was said, and what the verse is actually talking about. And then you can use it to justify some teaching in context. It's very important. Um, there's a lot of false teachers around, and that is one of the best ways to see that they don't know what they're talking about, if they're using verses out of context. Okay, Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 23. So I'm going to bring the context into it first. Okay, and when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority do you do, you do these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I will likewise tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why did you not believe him? But if we say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. So he's talking about John the Baptist. 
And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said to them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. But what think you? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I will go. But he didn't go. Which one of them two did the will of his father? And they said to him, The first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the publicans and the harlots will go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and you when you had seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. So he's saying that the two sons, okay, the, the, the publicans and the harlots are the ones that said, I will not believe him. But then afterward they repented and they went and believed him. But the, the Pharisees, are the ones who said, I will believe him. Like, when he comes, when the great prophet comes, I will believe him. But then they didn't do it. So, that's what that parable is talking about. Then he said, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he let it out to husbandmen. He rented it out to a farmer or to, to a businessman. And, went, and he went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. So he, went, he sent his servants there to go collect the rent for using the vineyard and the wine press. And the, hus the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did to them likewise. But last of all, he sent to them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandman saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. And when the Lord, when the Lord therefore of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these husbandmen? And the, they said to him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's quoting Psalm 118, which we will look at in a minute. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Okay, so there's the parable. The kingdom of God, the, 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 uh, the vineyard and the wine press are the kingdom of God. And they, the Pharisees, are the husbandmen, the wicked husbandmen. So the, the servants that were sent that were killed are the prophets. And now Jesus is the son and they want to kill him and steal his inheritance. So he's saying, this is, by your own words, you are being judged. Is the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. So now he's talking about the, the two verses in Isaiah that we read, 
the the in Isaiah chapter 8 the stumbling stone whoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken but on whoever it shall fall it will grind him to powder so what does that mean that Jesus is the stumbling stone and he's also the foundation stone so whoever falls on the stone that's Whoever believes in Jesus, you have to repent. You have to see the sin in your life. And you have to see, I have not really been following God. And uh, I have to submit to Jesus and his teachings. And accept his death and resurrection for my righteousness. For my righteousness by my faith in him. So so you are broken, you are humbled, and your pride is broken. So that's whoever falls on the stone. But whoever the stone falls on will be completely crushed into powder. And those are the ones who do not believe, but uh, the stone's coming on them anyway. So the stone will crush them. So there are two sides to this stone. It's like a two-edged sword. There are two sides to it. Okay. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke about them. Well, yeah, he did. And when they sought to lay hands on him, to arrest him, They feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. So they feared the people. There's too many people would have opposed them. So let's take a look now that we've read that. Let's take a look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Thanksgiving for the Lord's salvation. Okay, we're going to find the part here. Uh, starting in verse 19 up to the end of the psalm. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. Remember Jesus said, I am the gate. This gate of the Lord unto which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and are become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us the light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. So Jesus is the foundation stone, the head of the corner. He's the head corner stone. So what is the head corner stone? When uh, when you see a building that was built in the past century, uh, like a big building, like a bank or some other important building. You'll see on the one corner at the front of the building, uh, uh, one of the stones is like a different uh, fancier shape or a different style than the rest of the building. And it has like the date the building was built and some dedication written on it. That is after the tradition of the chief cornerstone. And what the chief cornerstone was in ancient times was the very first stone laid when they built a building, especially a temple. And uh, they would um, 
offer sacrifices oftentimes and they would put the ashes of the sacrifice underneath the head cornerstone uh, and they would lay the head cornerstone. It was the very first stone they laid and it had to be a perfect stone and it had to be perfectly square and it had to be set in the right spot and it had to be set perfectly level and it had to be set in the right direction especially for a temple because a temple back then it was very important that the temple was pointing in a certain direction so the first stone had to be set at the perfect direction because every other stone laid in that building is measured off of the chief cornerstone so everything if the first stone is crooked the whole building is going to be crooked so the first stone is extremely important to be laid perfect that the other stones which are not so perfect but they're all square with that stone because they'll use the plummet and the line from that stone to put the rest of the building together. So that's the head corner stone. And Jesus is our head corner stone. Okay, we're going to take this further now. So let's take a look. Um, now that story in Matthew chapter 21 that we looked at, you'll find the exact same story, but maybe in less detail in Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 20, if you want to take a look at that. Um, now, let's take a look at Acts chapter 4. Okay, Acts chapter 4. Now, at this point, um, Jesus had already been crucified and risen from the dead and gone back to heaven. And now this is the time when the apostles are preaching. And the apostles Peter and John were in the temple courtyard and there was a man there, a crippled man, who was um, begging. And they healed him and made him walk. And when he walked, all the people were amazed. And then Peter uh, began to preach the gospel of Jesus in the temple which at that time was illegal because they had just crucified Jesus for doing just that. And so they arrested uh, John and Peter and uh, they put them in jail. So now we're going to look in Acts chapter 24 or Acts chapter 4. We're going to look now in Acts chapter 4 starting in verse 5. And this is the next morning for the trial. And it came to pass in, on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Cephas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they put Peter and John in the middle of the crowd of, of rulers and they asked by what power or by what name have you done this so they're asking the same question that they asked Jesus by what authority do you do this then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said to them so this is the Holy Spirit talking through Peter you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who you crucified, who God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. So they even brought in the guy that was healed to the court. 
This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. So he also quotes Psalm 118. The stone that was rejected by you has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Okay, so let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. Uh, Romans chapter 9. Now at that time, Greek was the um, common language of the entire Middle East. Uh, Coin Greek, they called it. It's a, an ancient form of Greek. Um, because of the conquest of Alexander the Great, even under the Romans, the Eastern Empire was all Greek, and the Western was Latin. So, um, now the Jews in Israel, they spoke uh, Hebrew, but they lived in a Greek world. So, they called all the other nations around them the Greeks, and they called themselves the Jews, or they called themselves Israel. So, when Paul is talking about Israel and the Jews and the Greeks, he, Israel and the Jews are the Jews in Israel, or um, the nation of Israel are the Jews. Now, they were also uh, had um, scattered communities in the other cities, but they still considered themselves Israel. And the Greeks was all the other nations. They were called the Greeks because they were just the non-Israelites. Okay, so here Paul is talking about um, his love for the for Israel and for the Jews, his own people, and why. Um, well, well, I'll just read it. Starting in verse 9, or Romans chapter 9, verse 1 to 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of who came as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So he's saying, okay, Israel today is not all Israel, because even in Abraham's time, not all Abraham's children were called. Um, Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac, and God chose Isaac as the children of God. So, as the children of Abraham and the children of the promise. So that is, so continuing in verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So, um, so he's saying, well, not is all Israel is saved. It's just the way God works. He chooses who he chooses. It's those who believe. So, um, now we'll continue on. 
down in the same chapter to Romans chapter 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, or the Greeks, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, the law of Moses, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written in Isaiah chapter 8, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And in Isaiah chapter 28, And whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Or in Isaiah it says, shall not make haste. Which is to run away in fear and in shame. All right, now we'll carry on in verse, in chapter 10 of Romans. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks in this way. Say not in your heart who shall ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. So what does that mean? Don't sit there saying who is saved and who is not saved. Who is saved? You are bringing Christ, the judge, down to earth. Uh, we don't know who is saved. We know what what but you believe to be saved, but we're not picking out who is a believer, who is not a believer, who is this and who is that. And verse 7, Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring Christ up again from the dead. So who's going to hell? This guy's going to hell. That guy's going to hell. So now you're resurrecting Christ from the dead. Now, again, to um, to save those people. So we are not the ones to judge who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's Christ's job. So let's start from the beginning again. But the righteousness which is of faith speaks in this way. Say not in your heart who shall ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. But what does it say? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That, if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. So where does it say that? Isaiah chapter 28. Whoever believes on him shall not make haste, or fear, or be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, so that's the, uh, the stone, the, the, 
the stone of stumbling and the foundation stone. So now um, let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. All right, the Ephesians, this is in the town of Ephesus. Uh, they are Greeks. They are um, Gentile Greeks who are believers. And this is who Paul is writing to. But when he says both, he's saying both. He's saying the Jews and the Greeks, both are one in Christ. So this is what he's talking about when he says both of us. So Ephesians chapter 2 starting in verse 18. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, fitly framed together, grows up into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So he's talking about the church. The church is a, it's the people of, God, of believers which are the habitation of the Spirit of God built all according in line with the foundation stone. We will take a <clears throat> finally we will we'll take a look at what Peter has to say in 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter two. Okay, first Peter chapter two, starting in verse one. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, guile is deceit, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. If so, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, unto whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, the stone the builders rejected. You also, as lively stones, living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Therefore, also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes in him shall not be confounded or ashamed. So here he is mixing Psalm 118, with Isaiah chapter 28 and these are this is what is contained in the scripture unto you therefore which believe he is precious but unto them which be disobedient the stone which the builders is disallowed the same is become the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense so here, Peter is mixing Psalm 118, the stone the builders disallowed, with Isaiah chapter 8, the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. So continuing with Peter, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now a people of God, which had not obtained mercy, 
but now have obtained mercy. So now he's uh, referring to a study that we did already on Haggai chapter 1 and 2. And you will find that study in episode 24, part 4. That's about the... Uh, um, you were not... Those who were not my people shall be called my people. Okay, well, that ends this study. And uh, I thank you for listening. And uh, we will carry on with our studies about the Apostle Peter in the next video. We'll see you then.